Morning Year 10, it's Miss Singleton here and today we're going to be looking at the poem Kamikaze which is by Beatrice Garland and it's one of those power and conflict poems that you've been studying in preparation for your GCSE. So there's five main things we're going to do in today's lesson. We're going to talk about what Kamikaze is, what the poem is about, we're going to look at a little bit of context in terms of Japanese culture, we're going to read and analyse the poem and then you're going to answer a question about the poem, okay? So, to get straight in, task one will require you to just summarise the information that I'm going to talk through, okay? You can do that in any way you want, bullet points, you can do a mind map. I don't mind how it's presented, but it's important that you get the key parts of this information down. Um, feel free to pause it at any point if you need to sort of finish off your notes before I move on to the next slide. So... Uh, what is kamikaze? Kamikaze, which means in Japanese, divine wind, um, was a term we used to refer to a special unit of pilots that fought for Japan in World War II. Um, and they had the horrible job of flying their planes, which were loaded up with explosives and not much fuel, just enough to make it to their target. Um, they had to fly that into the enemy ships. Um, which would then cause a huge explosion and cause lots of damage and obviously would result in the death of the pilot themselves. Now, you might think that sounds crazy, but it was actually considered to be a great honour to be chosen for the mission. And the pilots um, who sacrificed themselves were known as warriors. Um, now, warriors have always been present in Japanese culture. I'm sure you've heard of samurai um, warriors who had the samurai swords. It all comes from this idea of being sort of strong and masculine and defending your honour and your family. Um, if you were a pilot who didn't fulfil that goal, if you turned back, um, you were either executed for going against your government and the army, or if you were sent home, you would be shunned by society, which means everyone would turn their back on you. Nobody wanted to talk to you. Um, even in some cases, the immediate relatives of the pilot would disown them, which means that they'd kick them out of the family because they brought shame and dishonour into the home. So it was viewed as a really serious thing if you returned from a kamikaze pilot flight. So that leads me on to what the poem is about. So it's a narrative poem, which means in essence it's a story, and it was written by uh, Beatrice Garland, sorry, in 2013. So Beatrice Garland, being a British poet, hasn't actually experienced um, this herself, but she often writes from the perspective of someone else. And she does a lot of research into the perspectives of different people in different cultures so that she can sort of spread a wider message. Um, so the poem itself tells the story of one specific pilot who is halfway through his journey and he decides to turn back because he starts to think about the memories he's got of his childhood um, and he starts to think that maybe life's too important to throw away so he, he returns and goes home. Um, however, when he gets back home, his whole family disown him for his dishonourable actions, including his daughter, who's the poet's main speaker. Okay, So it's a, it's a very upsetting poem because there's almost no escape for this pilot. He sort of has to experience something horrible and potentially deadly, regardless of what he chooses. Um, throughout the poem, you'll see references to the main themes, which are war, honour, power, nature, identity and loss. So those crop up quite a lot through this poem and you will start to notice them as we read it. Um, it's also useful for you to remember that the poem is made up of sestets, which are six line stanzas, but the rest of it is written in free verse, so there's no regular rhyme scheme or rhythm or anything like that. It's very flowing, which makes it sound like a story. Um, you'll also see on the left-hand side, I've popped a picture of the Japanese Imperial Army flag. Um, now, this was used in World War II by the Japanese. They sort of wore headbands with the flag on um, and had a lot of flags on all the planes and stuff. And this flag is called um, something like Rising Sunrise. And there's a lot of references to sunrise and to flags in this poem. So I thought it's important that you knew what that looked like so you can understand that reference a little bit more clearly. Final slide um, before we start to read the poem is about Japanese culture. 
So you might be thinking, well, why did people think that about these pilots if they returned home? Why were they were they shunned and, and shamed for their actions? Well, Japanese culture has always been really influenced by the government and by its leaders. It's always had very strong um, dictators throughout history. Um, a dictator, if you're not sure, is sort of a person who is completely in charge of a country on their own. So there's no government or anything like that. They are sort of the founding person who makes the decisions for the country. So even as early as the 12th century, Japan was ruled by these dictators and beneath them there were people called feudal lords who were very rich and had a lot of power and then they were protected by the noble warriors who we called samurai, which is where that comes from. So there's always been a culture of strength and, and patriarchy, which is a male-led society. Um, during World War II, Japan had got really strong in terms of its economy and in terms of its army and it decided to expand its empire and so it began to make plans with Germany and Italy who were obviously fighting against the allies who were Britain and France and America. They wanted to gain more territory basically, they wanted to own more of the planet. Um, so that's what they were fighting for and so to convince the members of the public in Japan that this was something that was good. They used a lot of propaganda. You probably already know what that is, but in case you don't, propaganda is information um, and it's usually biased or misleading and it's used to promote a political cause or point of view. So in this instance, propaganda was used to sort of um, make those kamikaze pilots look like heroes, look brave and strong and something that you should want to be, so that more people would would want to do that job. Okay, You'll see on the left as well, there's an example of some Japanese propaganda. Um, the man is clearly stamping on the heads of the other allies. Um, so that was something that was very commonly seen around Japan during the war. Um, the propaganda often demonised the Allied forces, so it made the Allies look like horrible people, like they were evil, so that um, the Japanese society would want the war to continue. And it also reinforced those patriarchal expectations of honour, strength and patriotism. So the idea that men have to be honourable, strong and have to be completely devoted to their country. And then to sort of back that up even more, if you did not fulfil your duty, you would be sort of punished to sort of reinforce that idea that you had to be all those things okay i appreciate that's a lot of information i suggest pausing here for 30 seconds and just finishing off your notes making sure you're ready to go into the next part okay okay either you've paused and you've come back or you didn't pause so i'm going to move straight on to reading the poem so as i'm reading through this i just want you to have a listen to it and think about how it makes you feel as I read through. So, Kamikaze. Her father embarked at sunrise with a flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, a shaven head full of powerful incantations, and enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. But halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boats strung out like bunting on a green-blue translucent sea, and beneath them, arching in swathes like a huge flag waved first one way then the other in a figure of eight, the dark shoals of fishers flashing silver as their bellies swivelled towards the sun, and remembered how he and his brothers waiting on the shore built cairns of pearl-grey pebbles to see whose withstood longest the turbulent inrush of breakers bringing their father's boat safe. Yes, grandfather's boat, safe to the shore, salt, sodden, awash with cloudy marked mackerel, black crabs, feathery prawns, the loose silver of white bait, and once a tuna, the dark prince, muscular, dangerous. And though, and though he came back, my mother never spoke again in his presence, nor did she meet his eyes, and the neighbours too. They treated him as though he no longer existed. Only we children still laughed and chattered, till gradually we too learned to be silent to live as though he had never returned, that this was no longer the father we loved. And sometimes, she said, he must have wondered which had been the better way to die. Okay, 
let's start picking this apart. So you'll see there's a lot of writing on here. Again, if you need to pause it as I talk through, you can do. What I want you to do is choose two of the quotes that I've highlighted and make sure you annotate that quote either on a copy of the poem or on a document. I don't mind how you do it, but you need to have some examples on there from each of the next three slides of sort of that analysis. OK, so her father embarked at sunrise. This first line is introducing us to the narrator and to the other voice in the poem, who's the daughter. OK. Um, the word embarked suggests that this mission is going to be long and difficult for the pilot. It's not going to be something easy to do. And as I said earlier, the noun sunrise is a reference to the Japanese flag and the patriotism of the soldiers. Um, it says that he's got with him a flask of water and a samurai sword. Um, now, the noun samurai sword is a reference to the honour bestowed on the pilots because they were viewed as warriors. So that's sort of quite symbolic that he has that with him. Um, it says that he has a shaven head full of powerful incantations. Now, a shaven head in this instance is supposed to be a symbol of purity, um, suggesting that the pilot's cleansed of any sin um, by completing this mission. And the noun incantation is a word we use um, when we talk either about magic or sort of religious uh, ceremonies. So that could imply that this man is relying on either something supernatural or his religion to fight his natural instinct of survival. So the only way he's going to get in this plane and fly um, on a suicide mission is if he, he convinces himself it's the right thing to do. So already we've got little trickles of doubt being hinted at. Um, he's got enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. So that one-way journey into history tells us that he's not going to be returning from this mission. But it's also metaphorical. He's flying into history both because he's a part of some of the most famous historical events ever and because he's literally about to become history himself. He's going to be dead. Uh, the enjambment, which is when a sentence continues from one line to the next um, in a poem, which is what is happening throughout these two stanzas, um, is suggesting the continuity of a journey. And it could also sort of suggest that the pilot's quite restless because it, it reads quite quickly without any punctuation on the end of the sentences. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about this bit here, but halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boat strung out like bunting on the green-blue translucent sea. So she is sort of talking about there the memory that he must have had as he looked down over the sea. Um, the simile, little fishing boats strung out like bunting, creates quite a positive image um, of people enjoying their life on the ground below. And that sort of is already foreshadowing the regret the pilot's going to feel for leaving. Um, and the noun bunting in particular has connotations of celebration. We put a bunting up when there's a party and we're sort of doing something fun, which could also represent the pilot's celebration of nature and the beauty of life that he's starting to realise he loves. Um, in particular, the imagery from the phrase green, blue, translucent sea is really vivid, makes the sea down below look like a paradise, um, which suggests the pilot is starting to realise the value of his life and the things he's going to miss if he completes this mission. Um, next, then, it says, and beneath them, arching in swathes like a huge flag waved first one way, then the other in a figure of eight. The dark shoals of fishers flashing silver as their bellies swiveled towards the sun. So again, we've got that reference to the flag and to patriotism. Um, it's supposed to represent the importance of dying for your country in the culture of Japan. And it's also um, trying to show us the immense pressure the pilots felt. Huge flag. It makes the flag sound massive, like it's overbearing. Um, and it's all the pilot can think about. Um, the fish here are a metaphor of people, basically. So the narrator doesn't describe just one fish. He describes all of them moving together. And it's sort of supposed to show us the way an individual person can become lost in society, particularly in a place where there are, there's very rigid uh, societal codes in wartime. So sort of it's 
uh, representative of the fear the pilot's feeling of moving away from that shoal of fish who are all doing the same thing. He's got to sort of be different if he wants to survive. Um, the flag that the pilot imagines in the water is almost mocking the flags that um, the country used to brandish at war. The fish are simply waving their flag, if you like, because they're alive and they enjoy swimming and moving. Um, and that's reinforcing that idea, again, that the pilot's doubting his decision to complete this mission. We then move on to the second and third stanza. Um, and he remembered how he and his brothers, waiting on the shore, built cairns of pearl grey pebbles to see who's withstood longest the turbulent inrush of breakers bringing their father's boat safe. So in this bit, he's, he's sort of remembering here um, making little towers out of pebbles in the water and they would see which tower of pebbles could stay stood up the longest as the waves came rushing in as the boat of their father came in from the sea after fishing. Now, in all of these, there are lots of examples of figurative language. Figurative language, in simple terms, are words or phrases that create a really strong image for the reader. So it makes it really easy to imagine what the reader is imagining. Um, so what the writer wants to do here is create a strong image of the pilot's memories with his family. So to the pilot, he's almost reliving this memory. Okay, um, We've got some specific examples of that. We've got um, the salt, sodden texture or maybe taste or smell of the boat and the sea. There's a lot of sibilance in there, so we've got shore, salt, sodden, a wash, a lot of S sounds, and that could mirror the sound of the waves. So the writer is thinking about all of the senses that we experience and is trying to touch on all of them in her description so that we can completely imagine what is happening in the pilot's brain as he remembers that nice memory of his family. Then we've got a little bit in italics. Now that shows that when there's italic text, there's a change in the narrator. So when it's italic, the daughter is speaking in first person. When it's not in italics, it's just an unnamed narrator sort of speaking on behalf of the daughter. Okay, easier. So it says, safe to shore, salt sodden, awash with cloud marked mackerel, black crabs, feathery prawns, the loose silver of white bait, and once a tuna, the dark prince muscular dangerous so there's no other full stops in this poem um, up until this point and that's used to signify a change in both the narration and in also the pilot's heart as he realizes he's not going to do this mission he can't he can't die um you'll notice the description is very um sort of suggestive it helps you to imagine um the fish that the grandfather used to bring in. Description is really, really strong and it helps you to imagine the pilot's father rowing back to shore with all the different fish. Now, in particular, the tuna fish has a lot of dark connotations. We use the word dark, we use the word dangerous, muscular. Um, so all those connotations foreshadow the deadliness of this mission if it's finished. Okay, and it sort of co connotes strength and um and loss okay so as we move on from this bit we then end up hearing from the daughter's perspective what happened upon his return so those italics show as the pilot's daughter's now speaking she's almost explaining what happened to her father to her own children so that she can sort of explain how she felt and she says and though he came back my mother never spoke again in his presence nor did she meet his eyes, and the neighbours too. They treated him as though he no longer existed, and only we children still chattered and laughed. So, um, when it says, my mother never spoke again in his presence, that's showing the lack of respect that the family feel towards him now he's returned alive. And it says the neighbours too, so even sort of the people that don't know him as well, sort of look at him with disgust and disrespect because he's arrived back from a mission he shouldn't have. Um, and it says they treated him as though he no longer existed. Now, this is an example of irony because even though the pilot's returned home alive, he might as well be dead because nobody wants to speak to him and people treat him as though he isn't there. 
So it's almost like a fate worse than death because he has to experience the loss of his family and his friends through his actions. And it says underneath that, only we children still chattered and laughed. So the verbs chattered and laughed stand out here. Um, they're really positive words and they juxtapose the other negative language that we see through this. Um, and this, I think, represents the innocence of the children just because when he arrives back, they're happy to see him and they don't understand the pressure that he's faced due to his decision. Um, but the final stanza is the most poignant, the most significant, because it says that gradually they too learn to be silent. So the verb silent is important here. So eventually, even his children who love him and, and are happy his home learn not to speak to him. And that shows the fear that these people had of speaking out against the patriotic regime that Japanese people had to experience. Um, it could also be symbolic of the loneliness that the pilot feels as even his children now disown him, um, even though he has come back and he wants to sort of celebrate his life um, he was expected to die for his family and they don't forgive him for not um, and the last two lines are where the next full stop is and this is very important sometimes she said he must have wondered which had been the better way to die uh, now this suggests that the daughter might be feeling regret now for the way she treated her father she sort of feels sorry um, for him and for the choice he made um, she regrets ostracizing him casting him out of the family because it was as if it was a death sentence for him um, this makes the reader feel sympathy for the pilot because sadly he chose to value his family and peace over his duty and that was really detrimental for him <clears throat> so we've talked through that i appreciate that's a lot of information if you need to pause and go back through feel free now OK, so you should have those notes down. You should have at least two quotations from each of the three slides that I've just talked through. And that information is going to be the foundation for the answer to the question on this slide. So I want you to write two paragraphs at least answering the question. How does Beatrice Garland show the negative impacts of war in the poem Kamikaze? So you need to tell me how the writer shows war is bad and violent and detrimental to people in this poem, okay? So you'll see underneath the question, there's some sentence starters there for you. So if you're not completely confident um, writing the paragraph without any support, you can just use those each time and just fill the gaps in with your quote and your analysis. You'll see I've also included some keywords. I'd like you to try and include at least one or two keywords in your answer. It will really boost the vocabulary and also the sort of academic sound of your response. And what I've also done, I've made a list of all the poetic devices that I found in this poem. OK, now you don't have to use all of them. You might not remember what some of them mean, but they're just there to help you um, in case you, you're struggling a little bit to find any of those examples. You've got the terms there to use. OK, um, make sure you answer this properly thoroughly it's something that you're going to need at GCSE and if you can practice this now you'll find it absolutely fine when we come to do it again over the next year um, that's it from me if you're still tuned in well done um, you've done well and I can't wait to read what you respond um, take care year 10 bye